This lecture covers the two topics of community ecology and ecological succession, starting with community ecology. So restoration ecology is the study of the structure of ecosystems, whereas ecological restoration is the actual practice of restoring them. So that's kind of a technical distinction and they're sometimes used interchangeably. But the whole point is that to, to know how to restore an ecosystem, you have to know about how they function, the relationships of the organisms to each other and the organisms to the environment. You need to know about the, the ecological communities and some of the attributes, the way that we look at them and understand them to know what to do to rebuild them. And that's what this portion of the lecture is just a, a short introduction to that. So if you think about an ecosystem um, and especially a community, which is not the environment, but just all the living species, all the different living species in a particular area and at one time, that's the community. And mostly we're talking about the plant community. But any type of community has species diversity, different species there. Um, different interactions, so species interactions, and then the spatial structure of that community. There's tall trees, medium size, there's microbes, there's big animals, small animals, just the, the structure there, including the land, and then the temporal structure too, and that's where succession comes in, how that community changes through time, and uh, successive communities kind of transition from one to another. So you would never notice it, but any time the human goes and looks at a particular community, it's it, that's just a snapshot. But for a long time, people thought that that was static. We go and see this community, and that's kind of how it, it has always been and always will be in, in lots of instances. So we've learned a lot since then, but we're just starting out talking about the traits or attributes of communities as a way to better understand them, leading to a better way and more success at restoring them. Just take a look at this picture of a Joshua Tree woodland, as they call them, out in Joshua Tree National Park. If this area perhaps had a road put through it at some point and some restoration wanted to be done, which is the case out there, I worked on restoration projects where Actually, it wasn't the roads, but the road side. So when they first made some um, paved roads through Joshua Tree, it was a national monument at the time, they, they did a lot of damage to a big wide area. And then later the restoration was not taking the road out, the paved road, but restoring the native habitat all the way up to the road because it was like about 50 feet on either side was just nothing on either side of the road. So you'd want to know about the community there. What is that Joshua Tree woodland community like? What is the species that are there? The richness of the species, meaning all the different kinds. You've got Joshua trees, you've got yuccas, there's some smoke bush there, and I see some creosote. And there's many other um, plant species, but you'd also want to know about the form of the land, rocky outcrops, sandy bajadas, kind of lower lying areas. How does the water drain and pool and infiltrate. So that's the structure of the site. Um, and you also want to know this, again, the species richness and then how those the species are distributed across the land or the evenness or abundance of each of the species. It's called Joshua Tree Woodland because of the tallest, most prominent plant out there, which are these Joshua trees, which are a type of yucca. But they are by no means the most abundant of species out there. There's way more grasses and creosote bush and things like that, but these are just kind of the most eye-catching, so thus the name. But you need to know those, those different traits of the community and how they interact. And perhaps this uh, particular community you're looking at right here has not been like that for uh, forever. Um, and we do know that about 10,000 years ago, and I know that was a long time ago, but not in geological time and not in, not in the evolution of plant communities time. These things take a long time and they're always changing. We're looking here at a snapshot. Even in our whole lifetime, we're looking at kind of a snapshot 
of evolving plant communities. Um, we know from pack rat middens, these are these holes or burrows that pack rats have used in the Mojave Desert for over 10,000 years. Different pack rats, not ones that live that long, but they're used over and over and scientists have been able to dig down into the very bottom of these middens where the pack rats kind of leave their leftover pieces of plant material that they didn't eat and seen that eight to 10,000 years ago, this Mojave Desert was um, a wet temperate forest with pine trees and yew trees and fir trees. It was more like what we think of as the forest in Seattle today. So in other words, we kind of have to know the history of the site. I mean, that's a long-term history, but how it came to be, how the species interact. So we know when we restore it, we're thinking about those, those processes too. We're not just putting back what it looks like, but we have to put back the right abundance, the right distribution of the species, the soil, the form of the land, the drainage, um, and think about how these things interact. So it takes, it takes a lot to be able to restore and it's, it's not just um, a two-dimensional process. Here's a list of plant community attributes, traits, of things you'd want to understand at least a small amount before a restoration project was started. So you know that you are actually starting to rebuild the three-dimensional complex structure of that ecosystem as best you can, or put the things into place back at that site that will lead to that, um, that native pre-existing habitat before it was disturbed. So the different types of um, form or appearance or physiognomy the architecture, that would be the, the structure of the plants, um, different vertical spaces they take up, the trees, the shrubs, the ground covers, etc. And then also the physical and horizontal structure of the landscape itself, all the different species, the cover and leaf area index, um, phenology is the timing of the reproductive cycles of all the different species. Of course, the species composition, all the different diversity of species there, patterns and how they're spatially laid out. The species are distributed on the land, diversity, nutrient cycling. You'd wanna make sure the nutrients that are necessary for the community there to survive are intact. Um, the development of the plant community over time with succession and evolution and productivity. So that's just a smattering of what we see on this list and what would be needed to be understood to, you know, start off as successfully as possible on a restoration project. Again, the physiognomy is the external appearance of a stand, meaning a stand is a group of the same species or a similar species that, that create almost like a forest or woodland or shrubland type of plant community. It's um, another way of saying a stand is a unit of vegetation observed in the field. It's a little bit arbitrary, um, but basically what kind of what you think without knowing a lot about plant ecology, just what looks kind of like a natural grouping um, of the same or similar types of plants. An association is a plant community that has a relatively consistent species composition, kind of like chaparral, or you know, a coniferous forest, something like that, that looks pretty similar to the layperson. One analogy is that individuals grouped into species create stands and stands are grouped into associations. Within a plant community or any community, there's a different types of diversity. There's species diversity, ecosystem diversity, genetic diversity, and functional diversity. Those are all things that would kind of needed to be ticked off thinking about when trying to recreate a native ecosystem. And to talk again about the metrics of biodiversity, species diversity is a combination of species richness and evenness. And species richness is the number of species on that site, a number of different kinds. The species evenness is the, the uh, distribution of those species, how equitably or consistently are those any particular species distributed throughout that site? Is there one every per square foot or are they all clumped in one corner? 
if they were all this, um, all the individuals of one species were all clumped in one corner of your particular site that you're looking at, that would be very low evenness. So that's the difference between those two. And they're both used when you're talking about species diversity or biodiversity. One measurement of diversity is Simpson's diversity index. Using the formula in the upper left, you can calculate a number, a metric, that represents the diversity. This particular diversity index accounts for the number of species, so the, the, uh, different, the number of different species, and the relative abundance. And you, get, you can go through the calculations of the example shown here, and you get a certain number. And you can compare that to other numbers and other sites and communities to know its relative diversity index. Measuring and understanding the diversity of different species at a site at a particular time and the distribution of the abundance of those species throughout that space help us understand the patterns of those species on that site. Different forces can influence those patterns and how the species are distributed and those would be things that are listed there on the right. Plant species, um, they really follow the patterns of soil chemistry, soil moisture, water movement, or hydrology, the aspect of the slopes, whether they're, the slopes are facing north, south, east, west, or in between, competition for that water or nutrients in the soil, and seed dispersal too. That those factors are really important to know about for restoration, especially the soil part and the hydrology. That's what you need to recreate if you're trying to recreate a certain type of pattern of plants on the land, which flows right into the very often the patterns of the animal species on the land as well. One thing um, you can see at the very bottom of the list there under animal species, the predator prey relationships. Those are really important in um, patterning the distribution of animals and plant species and even algae, like is it in this picture, the inner, rocky inner tidal is a good example um, where you have some mussels, sea stars, algae, looks like sea anemones, a variety of different species there. And the sea stars eat the mussels and so do some other critters, but if you remove those, then what happens is the mussels are so vigorous and uh, aggressive in their reproduction, they will take over that whole space and it will become much less diverse. So you need something like a predator there that eats enough of the that mussel that it leaves open spaces for other things to come in and um, inhabit the space too. In, in other words, the predator kind of keeps the um, the prey at low enough levels that you can have coexistence of other species. So that's a principle from ecology that's important to know about for ec ecological restoration too, because you you if you're trying to restore this uh, uh, intertidal tide pool system, you would need to make sure you have all the species, including that predator. Just one example of how these relationships are important for patterning distribution of species on the land. So we have talked about different attributes of communities and mostly we've been talking about the aspects of the communities that are physical and ecological that are seen kind of at any given time. Succession is talking about how plant communities change over longer periods of time. Um, it's talking about the successive features of a particular community over time. You'll see one group of plants might be uh, prominent at one time and then in a hundred years that same exact site some of those same plants might have died off and other ones become more prominent. That would be how that community at that site um, succeeds one another. So it changes. That's ecological succession. And we'll look at the next slide for a written out definition. So plant succession is the directional change in the species composition. That's how different species come and go. Or the structure of a community over time, usually long time. If it's just fluctuating over seasons or wet and dry years, it's not succession. It has to be something that's more um, permanent in its change and over uh, more than just a few seasons. When studying 
ecosystems and plant communities for succession. The questions, some of the questions asked are what are the patterns that are seen? What are the patterns of how the different species, species communities change over time? And is the change predictable? Is there an endpoint, like some type of mature, stable community in which it stays for a long, long time? What processes or factors cause the changes that are seen in these successive communities over time? Are there different endpoints? And here's a couple of definitions. A seer is a unit or stage of succession. A serial community is one undergoing succession. So if there, if you took, let's say, a, a farm field and watched it over a hundred years, um, it would probably um, first grow some weeds and then maybe later 10, 20 years, some shrubs would come in, later some trees. It would change over that hundred years and each little section of time would be called a sear or a stage of the succession from bare soil after the crop died all the way to a small woodland with trees. A climax community is thought to be the final sear or the final stage. In our same example, a woodland, um, something where the trees grew up and they shaded out a lot of the shrubs and the earlier weedy grasses and things that came in first. And once it gets to that stage, and these are all conceptual theories of how pl plant communities change over time. The climax community would be the one that stays there for a long period of time, um, much longer than the other ones. So it's kind of thought to be the climax of that succession and the final stage or seer. Successional or serial, com serial community is the community changing towards the climax. So it's kind of like the seer itself. Here are four very important uh, scientists, ecologists that studied a uh, succession of plant communities. Henry Cowles in um, 1869 to 1939, he was the earliest one that developed this whole idea of succession, mostly from looking at and studying sand dunes in Michigan. Um, around Lake Michigan. I'll talk a little bit more about that in future slides. Frederick Clements, a um, little later, plant community development. He developed this, uh, the idea of the sequence of stages that, and that those resemble the development of an animal organism, you know, kind of the embryology, how we go through these different stages of development, um, humans and other animals. Well, plants, plant communities did the same thing reaching this stage where the climax community would be kind of like the most mature and final stage like an adult human grows into. That was his uh, analogy and idea. Henry Gleason, um, another plant ecologist, um, said that plant communities um, are a continuum, not a unit. They're not it's this thing that you look at and it's kind of static, but they continuously change. A species come and go, some um, some new species come in, some leave, um, but it's always in a continuum of change. It's You can't really chunk it up into these sears, this was his idea. And he also said, Gleason said, that the associations between the plants, when you see two plants or three or more all kind of uh, existing together, that those were coincidental. They are not um, somehow tied to each other, those different plants. Ecologically, they're not dependent and influencing each other. They just happen to be there at the same time. Frank Egler, one of my favorite ecologists, he came along even later and came up with these other two ideas called the initial floristic composition and relay floristics. And they're just two ideas about how any given plant community that you might see and all the species that make up it, two different ways that they can change um, and the way they start too. His idea of initial floristic composition is that all the species that are likely to be involved in a succession are all present at the beginning. Some are more predominant than others at the beginning and some become less predominant over time. So he wasn't accounting for, uh, in, in this idea, it doesn't talk about how new species might come into that site. It's just the species that exist there. 
some kind of get fewer and some get uh, more abundant over time in that succession. That's the initial floristic composition idea. Relay floristics is a little bit different and that does incorporate how some new plants can come into a site over time. You can read more there for more details. So primary succession, there are two types, primary and secondary. There's no tertiary, just primary and secondary succession have been identified. Primary is when a plant community develops on a site that for some reason has been um, denuded of anything alive or any vegetation, any soil. There's no soil, it's just bare rock, no plants, no soil. There's no what they would call biological legacy, nothing living there from which the community can develop from. It's just nothing alive. It's just um, inert and abiotic rock. That's called primary succession. One way that primary succession uh, occurs or comes about at all is through volcanic eruptions where there can be forests or soil plants and then an eruption happens and it completely takes away all of that. Anything living is gone and that creates a blank slate where primary succession can take place. Here's a picture of Mount St. Helens, um, May 17th, 1980, one day before its eruption. Mount St. Helens during its eruption. And the lower parts of that same mountain blown away um, just four months after the eruption in September. Note the helicopter for scale. This is a completely devastated, as far as life goes, landscape. And this is the type of place where primary succession can be and, and has been studied and would occur if it's going to. A very long-term and interesting study was done after Mount St. Helens erupted. And that was looking at the, um, the south slopes of what was Mount St. Helens and these one meter square quadrats, meaning just a square meter um, frame is put down in random places on the ground and all the species, types of species and abundance of them are counted in many places, many of them. So, and this is what the, the graph they got from eight, 1984 through about 2010, the, all these data points and this, you can see the number of species um, was very low, it was zero at the beginning, and it slowly a few came in, and then enough came in to start kind of a snowballing effect, meaning some species took hold, and then when you have plants take hold, they grow and die, and they start leaving organic matter building up in the soil around 1990, and then you also get animals coming in, and suddenly it starts to take off. You got some soil, more moisture holding capacity, and a lot, uh, a number of different plants come in. You can see there's almost 20 different species near the end. And these next few slides are the series of these quadrats. This is a, a slide taken, or a image taken of these, um, one location of these quadrats showing you over time how the species changed. So four years after the eruption, there was one species present. It was a lupin. Six years after the eruption, there was still only one species present on these slopes, and that was still the lupin. Nine years after the eruption, we've got an increase, an uptick. There's three species present. You can see the purple flowering lupin now. Um, so it's starting to increase. Something is happening there, this primary succession where now it's becoming somewhat habitable to plants and this community here is changing. In 1994, 14 years after the eruption, 17 species are present. So it's really starting to fill in and become quite diverse. This is six primary succession occurring and now it's 21 years after the eruption, 18 species present, so it's plateauing a bit. Being that this was just um, bare rock in 1980, you may not get a lot of species here for 100 years. 
bigger species because it still doesn't have a lot of organic matter on top of the soil that can hold moisture for bigger species. These are mostly annuals. They grow and die in one year. And 27 years after the eruption, you've got 18 species. And although the number of species hasn't increased, the, the cover, meaning how much bare soil is there and how much of that soil is covered by plants, is much higher. Secondary succession is a different form of succession or change, directional change of a plant community. It occurs on a disturbed piece of land. That's the same so far as primary succession. But in this case, it, that piece of land has some type of biological legacy. There's something living that's still there. Seeds, roots, microbes, maybe some plants, maybe some soil um, is present from before the disturbance. Um, and the things that can create the conditions for secondary succession to happen are things like um, crop fields left fallow. There's something there and then things start to grow back, but there is some soil and there's usually some seeds and microbes and some plants or a fire that comes through an area, chaparral, forest, um, prairie, hurricanes, uh, trees falling. All of those are examples of uh, where secondary succession can happen. This is a nice little graphic showing you um, succession after a fire. This table points out some of the characteristics of plants that would be in a early successional sear or stage and late successional stage. Um, let's look at a few of these things. Um, focusing more on the bottom half, seeds of early successional species are usually, there's a lot of them, the number of them, many, um, the size of them, small, dispersal distance, far, large, um, viability long. That means that the plants that come to a a site that has been highly or moderately disturbed are usually um, really quick growing little things that don't take a lot of water, don't take much soil. They can be blow in from far away and um, they can hang on there for a long time until the water comes. So they tend to be small annuals and weedy species at first. Later, as I said, let's think of our um, plot of land that was like a fallow uh, crop field that we that just stopped being farmed and it first turned into kind of a bunch of small weedy annuals which over time became um, some sh small shrubs which over a long time, maybe a hundred years, some trees started um, growing in and l much longer, maybe a couple hundred years, it turned back into a forest if there was adequate precipitation. So compare just with seeds to that same, um, the same table, but looking at late succession, the types of plants that would be there, there, instead of the number of them, instead of being many, there'd be few, a few trees instead of thousands of weedy grasses and things. Um, the size of them, the trees are obviously much bigger than small little weeds and grasses. Um, the dispersal distance of their seeds, their seeds are much bigger, so they're not going to be able to be carried as far by animals or the wind. Um, these are some of the ideas of how these uh, species are different between early and late succession. Um, let's look down below. The, at, towards the bottom, the growth rate too of early succession is rapid and late succession is slow. So again, think of the early weedy species that grow really fast and set seed all in one year. That's an annual compared to the trees much later that are slow growing in their growth rate and last a long time. This is a whole other kind of side note, but early successional species are also called R selected species, late successional called K selected. And that has to do with their growth rate and their sensitivity to carrying capacity. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about population dynamics. So it's interesting the evolution of how humans have looked at plant communities and it very much reflects kind of how we view our own human community um, and some of our ideas and even sometimes some of our fantasies. 
So one of them is this, the traditional view is this climax community in a succession is at an equilibrium stage. Again, our idea of the fallow farm field after a couple hundred years, it has become a forest which, and it stays a forest forevermore, happily ever after. Some of that's kind of true because it's, it, it is relatively in equilibrium because those trees are much longer lived and they don't change quickly. That forest is likely to stay there a lot longer than that early um, successional stage of grasses and weeds, which changes pretty quick into something, into some shrubs and things. But equilibrium is a big word, meaning it, it kind of, it's completely in harmony and nothing changes at all. And we know better than that now. This was an older view in plant ecology, but we know better that things are always changing. So there really is no equilibrium. There's really no climax community that doesn't change anymore, um, only relatively. The contemporary view is there's no equilibrium. Um, equilibrium is, isn't reached um, because there's always disturbances along the way. So another phrase came along calling plant communities a shifting mosaic, meaning um, you could have that forest start to develop, but it's not going to stay that way forever. Something's going to happen. There's going to be a wildfire or there's going to be um, a flood or maybe a pest will take out most of those trees. So there's always something that keeps thing, things in flux. It doesn't just stay that way forever. I think that's kind of like a, a human idea that we'd like to think happens. Um, yeah. Two other plant ecologists, well, actually just ecologists, um, Connell and Slatyer, kind of reworked some of Egler's models and another um, ecologist, Lawton, and came up with these four models of how succession occurs. One was the facilitation model, meaning the species early on to a site that has gotten disturbed, make the site more favorable for the next set of species that come in. Somehow they make it better, you know, more moist or more organic matter or more shade. Also, the set, uh, number two would be the inhibition model. The earlier species do something to inhibit the establishment of later species. Maybe they release some kind of toxic compounds from their leaves so other seeds can't come in. Eucalyptuses do that. Um, third, the tolerance model. Any species can start at the beginning of uh, succession, but those more tolerant of the conditions are the only ones that will remain. So somehow they can tolerate the whatever it is, low soil moisture, heavy clay, lack of nutrients, something. They just happen to be more tolerant. Uh, the fourth model is random colonization. Um, colonization of plants at a site that's been disturbed are, it's a chance survival of different species and random colonization by new species. There's no facilitation or inhibition. And this particular model is the only one that doesn't support the idea of pioneer species coming at first to a site due to their adaptation. So that one, I don't think as pop, is as popular or it doesn't apply as often because it's pretty well established that plants that have that quick growth they produce lots of little seeds that can that can go far are the ones that that typically are going to be the ones that um, colonize a newly disturbed site. This is one textbook's attempt to try to tease out the differences between these four models and the different researchers that came up with them and how they differ. Um, kind of note a couple of things here that are written on the right. The primary and secondary succession differ in whether there are some species already present at the start of succession. You know that because secondary succession, there is a biological legacy. There's plants usually present. Think of a wildfire, a fire like here around Santa Barbara comes through and burns everything to the ground. But a lot of these plants are still, their roots are still living, so they pop back up. That's a biological legacy. That would be secondary succession. And um, in red, some other notes I made, the four models of succession. If you look at these black arrows on the left, those are different starting points after disturbance. The light blue arrows are the species or the vegetation sequences over time. Um, for example, the top left one, A1, um, is, a, is a particular starting point. Species A gets established, and then B, and then C, and D. Curved arrows are species replacing themselves. 
and then you can see the plus, the negative, or the zero are the facilitation or inhibition um, models or no effect, which would be one of the other models. The facilitation model relates to that one called relay floristics and has two patterns depending on whether primary or secondary succession is occurring. You can dig into that more if you'd like, but it's just to kind of reinforce some of the basic concepts of these four models. Overall, a little chart I made to try to um, reinforce some of the basic concepts of these different models of succession. Again, uh, this is getting into the kind of theories in, in plant ecology of what's happening, but considering each of these models when one is planning and designing a restoration site is important to figure out. I, my personal opinion is all these models have some truth to them sometime at, at some sites. So you'd want to figure out what is happening at your site. Maybe, um, maybe it's facilitation is a really important thing. So you can plant the early species because you know that they're going to make it the site better for the other species you want to come next. Um, sometimes in um, in restoration people projects I've worked on people have taken the mature species that mature successional stage and tried to just take the same species and plant all those back but the soil wasn't hadn't uh, wasn't ready it had not healed enough or the hydrology, you know, the way it drained and held onto moisture wasn't right. So taking those species that you saw in the end point of what you want to restore didn't work. You had to go slowly back through the successional stages again. That would be more something around facilitation where you'd need to figure that out. Or inhibition um, or tolerance, you might need to know that, that there's something in that soil that plants um, they're either tolerant or intolerant of, and you'd have to work that into your design and plant the appropriate species. So these are really directly related to use in ecological restoration. Now let's look at four case studies of succession in these four different locations and something kind of concrete examples that will help you understand. First is this volcanic island of Surtsey off the south coast of Iceland. And it was a volcanic island. Um, it was, uh, there was nothing living on it, no biological history when it first became an island. It was, you know, a new volcanic island. Plants first colonized the island in 1965. And it kept having eruptions um, a little bit after that for two more years. But three plant, more plant species in the next two years came, but they didn't survive. Finally, in, in 1968, a sand seawort, it's a type of plant, and it got established, and it, it stuck, and it was followed by others. But not a lot of uh, other plants that had a very low diversity of plant species there for a while until um, the gulls began, began to colonize it, bringing in seeds and their own droppings, which are technically, you know, their own manure or nutrients that were derived from the ocean. Then the soil started to have a little bit of organic matter and then the nutrients came and then it became uh, something that had enough water holding capacity that larger plants could come in than shrubs. And then once you have shrubs, you get a lot more leaves growing and falling and you have more wildlife coming in and more seeds. So it really starts to um, grow in its diversity when that starts. And you see what I was describing in the last slide reflected in this graph where there was a low amount of species for quite a number of years. And really it's right at that point around 1990 when we started to see um, the seabirds come. Then that there was just enough vegetation and something there for the seabirds to land that they started to come bringing more seeds and the nutrients through their feces and then you, we saw a species of plants really start to take off. But again, this was a really neat example because it was a new island that in during you know, the last hundred years, there was nothing on it for decades. Scientists knew that and they could actually watch it happen from nothing to primary succession. And this is a great example of the facilitation model. 
the next case study is of the Lake Michigan dunes. So Lake Michigan, one of the Great Lakes, used to be much bigger 3,000 years ago, and it has successively shrunk over time since then, getting smaller and smaller. So the shoreline, um, as it's shrunk, exposes new um, parts of land that were used to be submerged, and when they are exposed, that is um, a type of succession. You had something that had no land plants on it and suddenly it's exposed and now it can be um, colonized and it keeps happening over and over and over again. So as you go from the current shoreline and go inland, you are walking through successional stages back 2,400 years to the lake's original size. And these have been studied closely um, knowing that these are examples of the facilitation model mostly um, and really good models and easy to see here are three images from three particular successional stages in um, right around Lake Michigan so a on the upper left is the 25 year old dune so it has been exposed for only 25 years and it's dominated by this dune grass so it, the lake used to be up above this and it receded, exposing this. And one of the first colonizing things is this seagrass that's um, shorter lived, has small seeds. The seeds can blow in, they have a big dispersal range. B, upper right, 150 year old dune. So that was exposed, the lake receded off of that 150 years ago. There's a few trees, lots of shrubs, and some grasses, so it's more diverse, and uh, the structure, there's more structure, and meaning bigger shrubs and trees and things, and probably a little bit of soil has developed on that sandy substrate. C is 400-year-old dune. There's pine trees, it's a forest, and, and red and white pine, and an understory of ferns. So there's definitely soil has built up here, and bigger species had time to dominate. This could be thought of as almost climax, but a, an image not shown is the 500 year old dune. There's no image, but the hardwood trees would begin to establish. So pine trees are different than hardwoods. Hardwoods be like oaks and maples and things. Um, so um, the diversity has mostly increased, but also the structure has increased. And this is graphically just showing the same thing as was shown in the images in the last slide. You're seeing the beach grasses um, take off at the beginning and then as that piece of land, that shoreline that was exposed, the dune grasses um, colonize it quickly and that's one successional stage. And then as the shrubs come in, they usually what happens is, is they shade out the grasses that need a lot of sun. And so they take over and the grasses or whatever that early colonizing species is um, subsides and goes down to almost nothing. Then the shrubs come in online. Some of the trees start to, but as the conifers, like those pines, start to take off, it looks like around year 170, the shrubs then get shaded out and they start to decline down to nothing and the conifers take over, becomes a coniferous forest, pine tree forest. And then at some point the hardwood trees are starting to creep in and, we ha and that's what we're seeing at the oldest stages now is that those will start to take over and the conifers will die out. That's just the exact same um, kind of sequence of stages that were shown in the images. So some interesting studies were done. It was assumed that this, these Mich Michigan um, shoreline succession dune systems were a facilitation model that you have the grasses coming in, the, the, the dune grasses that kind of start to build a soil and stabilize things and they lead to shrub, they help the shrubs come in, which help the pine trees, which help the hardwoods. But some studies were done that looked at, they took seeds of, um, of different species that grow there and mostly tree species and added them to some of the younger cereal stages, so to the sand dunes. And they saw that most of the seeds that were spread in those areas were, um, they were eaten by rodents. And it started people thinking about, well, actually it's not that the soil hasn't built up, 
that the pine trees are not there in the dunes or in the shrublands. It's because there are rodents um, that are eating the seeds that prevent the establishment of those pine trees. It's not because of time and it's not the facilitation model that the plants before helped the next plants. It was more of an inhibition. It's that some of the plants that grew there were they were the ones that the rodents were inhibiting the establishment of the later cereal species. This next case study of succession is not about plant community succession, but more about the insect community succession on carrion. Uh, researchers looked at the different types of insects and other microbes that colonized pig carcasses and watched how the species changed over time. Um, the beauty of this study related to succession is these carcass are microhabitats are small and have very clear boundaries, really easy to detect what's there and you know that it, it wasn't there before. And this is very clear boundaries where the dead pig is, you know, as opposed to like a plant community, it's kind of hard to tell where it starts and stops. Only about 30 species occur on small carcasses and they're, uh, of insects and they're easy to identify and count. And one can put out a large number of carcasses to get a lot of replicates to make that experimental design very strong and draw strong conclusions. So let's see what they found. This isn't really the results, but it's just telling you kind of how the whole experiment works or how this decomposition on a, an animal carcass works. Theoretically, like species A, insect would be one that came on like around day two is when this insect typically would come and start to be seen on a carcass. Species B might be there, but you don't see it. It doesn't ever get high enough numbers. Um, C, the same way, it could be there a longer period of time, but you don't get too high of numbers. D would be something that normally would be there from the beginning, but then on day three, the population explodes and you get a much higher number for a couple of days. E, you see coming over, like after a week, it starts to be visible. G or F and G are different. Every species comes in at different times and has different population growth and decline. And these can be seen as successional stages of the insect community on that carcass. And what you're seeing here is actually some of the results of these carcasses that they put out um, and for over eight days of which um, insect species came and were present. And then when they weren't present anymore, some of them came right away and stayed the whole time. Some came during day two and left on day three. Uh, lots of variations here. So earliest visitors to the carcasses are the flies. You might already know that when you see something kind of rotting, it probably hasn't been too long if you see flies on it. And the number of species to new carcasses is low, that's early succession, and it increases at midpoint and then declines during the final stages of succession. And species that appear and disappear then reappear are not really helpful um, to forensic investigators, but species that appear predictably at the same stage of decomposition are useful. So that's what's really cool about this is, is realizing that forensics, um, you know, if they, you wanna find out the, uh, how long a body has been there, um, you can, you using successional ideas of the different insects that are there and it's known which ones are there. Certain insects are, are there, you know, it's been dead over a week. Other insects like flies, you know, it's probably only been about 24 hours and, and I'm just giving you the course info. There's much more detail to it and it's quite interesting. Another study done just illustrating the inhibition model um, and that can be, the inhibition doesn't have to be a plant inhibiting another plant. It could be something like this with an, a native grazer, like a wallaby, um, with them present. The species cover stays very low um, with the grazing, but without the grazing, the species can increase quite quickly, you know, within a year. And so those grazers are inhibiting the early succession of herbaceous vegetation. This is just a nice picture of what would be called a climax state of succession around here, an oak woodland. This kind of looks like from, it's from San Inez. 
and it's a similar coastal oak woodland that even though it is changing it's changing at a very slow rate compared to um, if the, like if this is right next to some kind of agricultural field or if a bulldozer came through here and knocked a few trees out that would that would be say, secondary succession would start and you'd see quick changes of the plants growing there over the next 10 to 30 years but once it gets to this stage it remains there for a, a long time again the idea of climax state relates a lot to humans in our lifetime we don't see a change in our lifetime or a few lifetimes it, it but it is changing but the rate is much much lower this last case study comes from macquarie island and the rabbits and cats that were there and what happened and this is an island that's uh, between new zealand and antarctica very interesting place. European rabbits um, and later cats were, were introduced to this, this island. Um, first, the European rabbits in 1878 for meat. Um, there were ships, fishermen that would come by and come to the island. They thought if they could get rabbits on there, then they'd always have a source of meat for them to eat. Um, but they caused major vegetation changes because there were no vertebrate herbivores on the island before that. There was nothing that ate the plants. Um, and then the cats were brought in to eat the rabbits. Um, and then myxomatosis was introduced in 1977 and to reduce the rabbit numbers. And it did from 150,000 to 5,000 um, by 1985. So cats were then eradicated and then the rabbit population skyrocketed back up again. Um, in 2011, um, this uh, calcivirus was introduced. It's only dangerous to rabbits, and many of the rabbits were also poisoned, and then dogs were trained to find the last few rabbits and eradicate the island of all of those herbivores. Well, of the rabbits and the cats were gone by 2014. So while the rabbits were still on the island, some experiments were conducted, and this is what you're looking at a picture of. That's a picture of a rabbit exclosure, meaning they put a little fence to, around a certain area. This is just one of many where the rabbits couldn't get in. Um, and this is two years after they set up that little fence, that little protected area. So that um, Macquarie Island cabbage is what you see growing inside of that. That plant changed from rare to dominant on that island, from rare to the dominant species in only two years. Um, with removal of the rabbits. So um, this th this is where you see these different, this was human influence, but still an herbivore or a grazer brought in can drastically change the trajectory of successional change on a site. Lastly, I'll mention this um, one concept called patch dynamics, and it's really just trying to create a little bit more realism to this idea of succession and that is where there's a larger plant community and it might be undergoing succession towards this quote unquote climax state there's always smaller gaps or patches in the community sometimes exhibiting more rapid cycl cyclic or cyclical changes so what it means is you don't just have this one uniform successional stage that slowly changes into another there'll be a place where oh a gopher dug up a hole or there's a, uh, a fox burrow or a tree fell down. And so there's a patches of early successional um, stage sears within the greater context and lots of different ages of successional stages all in the same place. Um, that's the patchiness of actually how this works. It's not just these big areas, but it's always more um, complicated and as Frank Egler, one of the plant ecologists that came up with these models, said, um, ecosystems aren't more complex than we think. They're more complex than we can think. I like that one. It kind of puts some humility back into science about trying to understand everything. The uh, ecologist Watts studied the vegetation in Scotland. Um, Heather forms the fields that are symbols of Scotland. Um, and he was looking at this as an example of patch dynamics. The bare areas in this image are potentially areas where heather has gotten older, died, and been replaced by lichens, and then bare soil, only to then be, at that stage, be recolonized by small manzanita shrubs, 
which then facilitate reestablishment of the heather. So it's this little s cycle of succession happening relatively quickly in all these different patches in different stages of that cycle all together, creating this beautiful landscape.